focus this away for a moment. <laughs> Uh, what I'd like to do uh, in the brief time I'm going to have with you uh, is to give you a broad overview of this concept of mega regions just to begin to ground our conversation a bit. So I want to get you up to speed with kind of what is current thinking practice research um, so that we can have a more fruitful discussion. Um, so mega regions are networks of urban centers. They didn't just pop up. They are major cities we've had for a long time. And now they have this emerging phenomenon that's going, uh, that's occurring, uh, creating different geographic footprints. Uh, they capture economic and network relationships in a spatial context. So there's a whole spatial dimension that we've ignored uh, that's really critical to our economic engines and critical to our mobility systems. Uh, they offer the promise, uh, happily, of greater connectivity, uh, I would offer. And our challenge is, how do you make that connectivity smooth? How do we make it continuous with minimum uh, disruption? Uh, in that regard, ha. Huh. What I am going to do is to frame a general picture of mega regions, transportation, and freight, focus a little more attention on the Piedmont Atlantic mega region, five states here in the southeast, uh, and then talk a bit uh, in some emerging trends, trends which are characteristic of where we are today, but really characteristic of, of the United States and, and the world. Uh, we, we find ourselves in a, in a common place in many ways with places like China and Korea uh, and increasingly Brazil. Uh, so the phenomenon we're talking about um, is global in this context, and I really appreciate the comments made earlier that reference that point. And then to, to look uh, into the future, take a, a little look forward uh, and anticipate some of the major drivers that will force us, um, I would argue, to make some different decisions. If we accept the fact that mega regions are one answer, not the only answer, uh, to this economic relationships operating nationally, regionally, and in world markets, we still pretty much plan from a, a city, county, state, national uh, perspective without really reflecting what's happening outside the U.S. It's really determining what we'll have to respond to, particularly if we look at this whole notion of sort of a keeping our competitive advantage, and I think none of us would disagree with the fact that we've enjoyed that for a very long time. They offer the promise of seamless transport, they support economic growth, but they also have a lot of challenges, and I want to talk about what some of those are as we go along. Uh, one of the uh, interesting reports that came out, and they do it biannually from the United Nations, talked about the fact that the biggest cities are merging into mega regions, and they call them endless cities, so if you look at Charlotte, Atlanta, Birmingham, and Raleigh, it's becoming a continuum. But we plan county by county, state by state, right, city by city, although they operate spatially in a very different way, much different than they have historically. Um, one of the spatial realities uh, is that while the world is operating this way, we're not planning in that way. Uh, and that's a part of our challenge, and that's a lot of the reason why we are here today, to examine how we might move much more uh, into that arena. So the concern then, and it's certainly evident here in the U.S., is to contribute to uh, the need for what we, uh, is clear, more metrics, uh, new tools, and methods to operate in a more competitive and dynamic environment. And Mike, I'm looking forward to our conversations. I'll share a little bit about uh, the sort of changing logistics and supply function and how it's, it's changing how everybody does business even as we speak. Uh, so it's a very different uh, competitive uh, environment that we're in, we're in right now. So over the next 30 years, about 70% of the U.S. population will live in 10 uh, mega regions. Let me... Um, give you uh, some idea of, of what those are. I, I have to say, because one of our sponsors, Fred, is here, this map is a very expensive map. <laughs> it didn't fall from the sky. It didn't happen overnight. In fact, it's the compilation of five to six years of actually examining economic trends, natural resources, uh, the headquarters for Fortune 500 companies, uh, uh, hospitals, schools, uh, to decide where are these economic engines. We argue there are 10 of them. We won't fight about the number. They exist, and they basically drive everything that we do. We don't think of them in this way. So this map uh, is a map that has tons of data underneath it. Uh, we started by just having pretty pictures, and they look great, but we weren't quite sure what they meant. So we spent a lot of time uh, having these really represent what happens in our economy. So 10 mega regions, uh, you see them here. 
Um, and I want to talk a little bit about them. The idea of this mega region is about 10 million people. Three of these 10 don't have 10 million now, but you know, of course, California, New York, the Midwest mega regions. And these are cities uh, that are connected, uh, that, that traverse state lines in terms of their economic interaction, where they work, where they live, uh, and they form these 10 uh, spatial concepts that we call uh, the mega regions uh, in the United States. A large part of this work has been funded by the Federal Ohio Administration. So why do we care? Why are they important? And I hope you will be blown away by this slide because I think it makes uh, the point I'm trying to make. If you look at mega regions, they constitute about 25% of our area, non-mega regions 70%, population, they contain 76% of our population, 76% of our employment, uh, 85 plus in terms of our uh, GRP, uh, Fortune 500 companies, 90 plus percent are located in one of these 10 mega regions. Uh, and uh, in terms of patents, innovations, ideas, 90 percent almost come from one of these 10 areas. Those are major economic drivers. It's a different way to conceptualize how our economy functions, and it has a spatial, a geographic footprint, which we've never conceived before. That's really why they are very important uh, for us uh, to talk about. And we've had um, some lovely experiences. This is a map. I didn't show you the first map that we had. It sort of changed over time. I spared you that. It was very ugly. Uh, and, and it wasn't uh, data latent. Uh, we are we're becoming more sophisticated uh, uh, as we have developed more information about maps. And so these emerging mega regions can be shown in any number of ways. Uh, this is the, the, the most recent uh, map that we have. And this is actually the map that appears on FHWA's uh, uh, mega regions website, the Federal Highway Administration, USDOT, and we're very proud of the work um, that, that we've been able to do uh, in that way. So uh, here's where we find ourselves, uh, something for us to think about. Uh, and I was in, I did a presentation not long ago, and they said, well, is this the bottom line? Is this the way it has to be? No, this is groping toward a concept uh, with an attempt to begin to measure it, to give you something that you can see and touch. Uh, that we think references the way in which we're going to have to grow, and certainly it references the way in which the world is operating. The challenges around these spatial uh, figures uh, have to do with uh, what is the regional vision for a mega region? What are, what, what are its goals? How do you even get to discuss the regional vision for a mega region or the infrastructure needs of a mega region? Uh, those are challenges, uh, part of the challenges um, that I referenced. Uh, we have different stakeholders. They live in different places. The whole question of how you finance transportation and investment across uh, different geographies, across different states, a part of the challenge uh, that confronts us now. And then what is this idea of sort of standardized data sharing? You know, Alabama says one thing, Georgia says something else, right? But they all talk about 20, 75, 85, and other corridors. So this idea of a common uh, uh, data sharing, analytics, and information collection systems are one of the kinds of set of questions we have to answer in terms of, of mega regions. Um, I want to make a couple of other points. One, I make the point that cities anchor mega regions. If you look at our major metropolitan areas, they've been around a very long time. If you look at London, Shanghai, Beijing, Seoul, the same phenomenon. Uh, is occurring, and they're making pretty different uh, investment decisions than we are, if you look at where they're spending their dollars now, because they're trying to connect these mega regions. So when they put a high-speed train between Beijing and Shanghai, it's not an accident. <laughs> it's a way to facilitate people. They create more capacity for freight by doing that, and they can move larger numbers. Um, that's, that's our competition. Um, I just want to, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want to do a little bit of, 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 of talking about how we think about this. One is, I've talked about, the, it's not just the mega region, but it has a huge area of influence. What happens in those economic engines influences what happens in places that are adjacent to them, and in some instances, very far from them. So the mega region, uh, I said to, to I was uh, talking at the University of Georgia on a Sunday morning. I did that. I got up. And I went to the University of Georgia on Sunday morning. I know a lot of you don't believe that, but it's true. And there was a woman in the audience, and she said, Catherine, I live in Nebraska. And, and I don't see my state represented. And I, I reminded her, I said, you know, you have an interstate system, and do you use it? She said, yes. I said, well, you know, we didn't start building it in Nebraska 
but it got there and we all benefit from it. And I think that's the kind of perspective we have to have when we have these kinds of discussions. It's not that it starts at your back door. It's important that it starts and it begins to develop a capability that allows us to be competitive. So I want to remind us of that just for a moment. So the idea is what are these spheres of influence? How do we talk about these places that are impacted by mega regions, rural areas, for example? We'll have some discussion about that later. There's a functional relationship. Where do you live? Where do you work? What is the function of utility? There's also a set of social, cultural, and uh, the chairman referenced some of that that we have to take. So it's layered. It's not just what happens to freight in those places. It is how do people live? How are they connected? Uh, what are the social differences? What are the cultural differences that we have to unite in order to move this concept forward? So we've been working on all three of those layers, and I just wanted to make, to make you aware of that. So what are some of the benefits we might expect from this approach? One, more efficient freight and passenger movement. Can you imagine if we had coordinated freight corridors that you can expedite travel that cross the state boundaries? My goodness. And they had a common uh, information collection, and so trucks don't even have to stop. They just keep going from state to state to state to state. I mean, there are things that we can do uh, to help uh, commodity and freight movement right now. Economic development, I've talked about that. Uh, driving our infrastructure investment decisions. I had the opportunity oh, three or four years ago to, to, to talk to the president about this. And, um, and I told him that, you know, one of the things that, and we're doing some of that, uh, again, Commissioner Eves, uh, Chairman Eves talked about that, is we have to be more strategic. Every corridor, are, they're not created equal. Some are really important to those 10 places that I talked about. And if they don't work, we don't work. So there is a hierarchy that we have to articulate, I think, that's tied to our economy that we've got to free, however we do that, so that they function uh, to our benefit. High-speed rail, I appreciate the comments on transit. Uh, one of the things that we have to do, given how little money we have, is we have to figure out how to make more capacity with what, uh, and use it uh, with what we have. That means giving people options so you don't have to drive everywhere. You can take a bus, transit, rail. That gets people off roads. And so maybe this idea of how we expand our freight capacity uh, has a lot of different answers. Uh, greater accessibility to economic centers and global markets are key. What's happened is that the ports are arising once again. You see everybody scrambling with the deepening of the Panama Canal. We're doing some rich work on that right now, uh, funded uh, by the Georgia Department of Transportation and, and the USDOT. What is that going to mean for ports? You know, and, and just really, um, I, um, one of my colleagues was talking about the fact that you know, we're deepening the Savannah port, make it more competitive because of what's happening in the Panama Canal. So you, you worry about those big ships coming in. And in Korea, they're worrying about, well, if you can't bring the ship in, can you take the goods to the ship? If you can't bring the ship in, can you take, do, is there a technology that allows you, the ship can stay out there, you just move certain kinds of goods out so the ship doesn't have to come in. That would flip the switch quite a lot. That's the kind of world that we're living in at this point in time. Natural resources and disaster planning would all benefit from this approach approach. So I, I made the point that these are not blueprints, they're goal signals. These are, these are, this is a geography and a capability uh, that's already, in fact, um, operating. And I know some of you can't see it, so I'm going to walk through uh, as, as, uh, as, uh, as, as well as I can to talk just about the high points. That's really um, what I want to do today uh, in any event. Um, one of the things that's happening in terms of uh, uh, the Federal Highway Administration is that they have created a new website uh, that lists r uh, a lot of resources, good work that's been done around the country, uh, globally, as a matter of fact, that looks at the same kind of phenomenon we're talking about today. So we wanted to reference that as a place that you can go uh, to sort of track on an ongoing basis because it's updated what the current uh, products, outcomes, uh, technologies are, and a lot of what I've talked about uh, would be available uh, there. So there's research on mega regions, work groups, funded reports, and then links uh, to other things that are being done. And so I offer that um, to you as a resource. We are, have just completed a pretty exciting piece of work. We surveyed all the uh, DOTs in the country uh, and the MPOs in the country. Um, and we're really happy that 51% of all the metropolitan planning organizations like ARC 
and 45% of all the DOTs responded. So we're developing, and I won't, I'm not going to go into the results of that today, we actually now have a database that can tell us exactly what's happening across the country with regard to mega regions uh, at the MPO level and the Department of Transportation level. So just to let you know that that work is, is ongoing, uh, and we would certainly intend um, to make it uh, available. This uh, is an initiative that started a while ago, and some of these people you'll recognize. I, uh, uh, Mayor Reichert, uh, I expected to, to be here. He was probably en route, Shirley Franklin and Pat. So these are people who got together and said, look, we really want to be proactive at a local level, working with universities, elected officials. Oh, he is here. I didn't see you come in. How are you? This is uh, the Mayor Reichert, uh, mayor, um, re newly elected uh, mayor of the Consolidated Bibb County Government. Did I get it right? All right. So we're delighted. <laughs> Welcome, Mayor. I didn't see you come in. We're delighted that you're here. And you can see he's been a longstanding partner. This is a great example uh, of local leadership recognizing the importance of what we're doing here today. And what I like about this, it makes the point that it's local, national, federal, and global. Uh, and, and that's really the message here, the idea of levels down to communities. So the Piedmont Alliance for Quality Growth, we started a while ago looking at the government, universities, and business members, and pushing this agenda, really working on implementation of projects that facilitate the mega region and facilitate better operations of our transportation system. And, and the mayor, and again, let me thank you, has provided great leadership uh, and steadfast support in that regard. And congratulations on your reelection. It's good for all of us. So let me talk for just a moment about the Piedmont Atlantic mega region. It's a, a brief uh, a, a snapshot. Uh, of that. Um, uh, this is just an overview and the idea that it stretches from uh, this, this connectivity one way, way uh, Birmingham to Raleigh, uh, fast growing population development, um, and it looks at population development patterns, geographic characteristics, passenger and freight movement, infrastructure linkages, and ecologically sensitive areas. All of this data has com been compiled in developing uh, our notion about what the mega region is. So what are some of the challenges? In the five states that I talked about, we have 504 counties, 72 MSAs, 2,722 cities, 76 airports, and 11 seaports. And we fight and share water resources, depending upon which state you're in. <laughs> the point that I want to make is that it's extremely complex and it's fragmented. Yet we're talking about a concept or an approach that will somehow knit all of those disparate parts together. And this is just one mega region. Can you imagine 2,722 cities in five states? That's one of our challenges, uh, and I could not help but uh, make that point with you. So we all know, in terms of looking at emerging trends, we are already looking at congestion. This is a look at congestion in 2040, uh, and it becomes very clear because of the heavy reliance on truck to move our commodities. We're like 85, 80% plus, 85% plus in terms of that being the major way we move commodities uh, in the southeast. And just ha what happens to what those corridors over time as populations increase when we look at 2040? We got parking lots unless we make very different investment decisions now. It's not getting to 2040 and saying, let's, we got a problem. We have to figure it out now. And this just idea that everything we're talking about gets complicated uh, when we take a, a look to the future. One of the things um, that um, I want to brag about, uh, Georgia, the DOT, has, I think, uh, is really leading the country. <clears throat> I can be a little biased if I want to, uh, uh, in terms of the statewide uh, freight and logistics plan. Um, they have really jumped out. And the reason that I really want to talk about this is I want you to look at the advisory committee members that they put together, the Home Depot, Coca-Cola, UPS, Delta, uh, all the way through Georgia Motor, Trucking Association, Norfolk Southern, CSX the airport, Southern Freight. The, the idea is that they did not sit in isolation. They had a wonderful private sector advisory committee to help guide what I think is one of the most innovative, forward-looking um, preparations. So I, I think if we keep building on what we've done thus far, we really do have a, uh, an opportunity to frame 
uh, the, the whole question of mobility and freight from a much larger geography than almost any other place is looking at now. So I, I wanted to um, call your attention to that uh, and uh, to let you know that it looks at all modes and supply chains in that regard. We've been doing a lot of work and looking at what's happening to uh, distribution uh, warehouses. I um, had the privilege of working with someone who uh, lives in Paris, and she's looking at the same phenomenon. They're actually consolidating these warehouses and distribution centers in Paris, in the city, where we find the trend here now in terms of warehouse is sort of disaggregating, spreading those out in some ways. So a lot of work is looking at distribution uh, center sprawl or, or expansion of some of those centers. And this is just a quick look at, the, at, the, at Atlanta, looking at uh, some of these distribution centers, how they're deconcentrating at the city level uh, and also obviously at the mega region level. Uh, the fragmented governance structures that we have makes this um, even more problematic. But just the idea that the location and warehousing is an important consideration as we look at this issue uh, of, of, of uh, mega regions. The rail network, uh, there's actually a mega region map, which I guess one of my doctoral students sent me a note 3 o'clock last night and said, Catherine, if you've seen the Federal Railroad Administration's map of, of mega regions, the, the idea that, that uh, the railroad uh, at the federal level is taking a lot of initiative to look at uh, this question of emerging trends uh, and a rail network that would support uh, freight and commodity movement. And of course, the trade-off there is always what percent uh, we have relative to trucks uh, and rail, and how do we balance that where we have really congested corridors and some opportunity uh, to improve mobility, improve the movement of goods. Um, so uh, this uh, is, a, is a part of what is on their agenda. And there are a couple of trends here, uh, and I don't want to spend too much time on this, really to offer it up as a way of thinking about an integrated, multimodal uh, set of answers to what uh, we are trying to accomplish. Um, there's one other uh, set of things that I want to talk about, uh, and then I want to have some questions and discussion. Uh, this is just a map of the United States. 50% uh, of U.S. employment um, is less than 4% of our total land mass. That's kind of how we live and, uh, and where, uh, where we live now. And you can look at the total share of U.S. population in 2013. And we just did gradation, so the high population centers are the dark blue areas, no surprise there. Our mega regions, no surprise there. Um, but what's happening in the future, I think, is a challenge for us. If you look at employment will be much less concentrated by the year 2040, what happens then in terms of us now going to places where we have less investment in infrastructure and, in fact, more and, and, and varied location relative to what's happening to the population spread? So it's becoming less concentrated and, I think, putting different kinds of demands uh, on our transportation system and perhaps uh, posing new challenges, if you will, with regard uh, to the, the passenger and, and mobility system, whether you look at the freight or the passenger side. So we can see a real move uh, toward a deconcentration, uh, less concentration by the year 2040, something for us to think about. One of the challenges of the suburban areas, of course, is that they were never really given the kind of investment you need uh, uh, to, to have uh, great mobility systems within them. So they sort of in and out, and then you get on line haul at uh, interstate or major arterial. And, but what happens when those kinds of things become even more fragmented? How, in fact, are we going to respond to that? So these are just some emerging trends uh, that we might not have considered, but they're going to very much impact freight and very much impact our mobility system, this idea particularly of uh, less concentration uh, in population and jobs, should I say, um, by 2040. The existing uh, highway network is oriented toward our current concentration, the point that we just made. Uh, if you look within our own uh, section of the country, again, high areas are identified, uh, growth areas uh, by the blue uh, areas. And if I look, um, uh, existing highway networks won't support future employment. So this is what it looks like in 2040, and this is where we got to get to now because this is where the population and the jobs are, right? This is what it looks like. So this is the existing, and look at the level of concentration now, and then look at what happens in terms of how much it disaggregates employment patterns over time. That's the network we've got to serve. Some concluding remarks, and then I hope uh, some questions. Um, the challenges we've, we've referenced in terms of infrastructure um, and that it's likely to continue, 
uh, ever-changing dynamics. I know Mike um, you're, will talk a lot about that. I'm really excited that you'll hear about what he's doing in terms of genuine parts and how they're operating based on what's happening to supply chain and logistics in that business. Uh, multiple stakeholders, a big issue, the point that was made uh, by the chairman, that those areas that are not um, at the centers of attention, they get um, driven over, right, impacted by uh, the kinds of activities that we're talking about today. How do they become a part of the discussion, if you will, uh, and, and how, in fact, do we include them in this process if we are to anticipate uh, successful approaches to plannings that are being uh, implemented under this mega regions concept. So um, uh, just to, to really get you to think uh, quite generally about what some of the opportunities are, some of the challenges relative to our topic for today, and um, implications for freight I think are huge. Everyone has said that it gives us a, a new lever if we can take advantage of it in terms of mega regions offering us a, a, a spatial, a funding, an operations perspective to improve commodity movement. Uh, so uh, I think it's true for all modes, and we'll hear that as our conversation moves along. And I think with that, we have four minutes for questions or comments, uh, if there are any. Yes, sir. Catherine, you brought up that um, some of the research that's been done in Paris shows a centralization of a lot of distribution right. facilities, right. whereas we're seeing in this country a decentralization. Is the research starting to give you any indication of what that's driving those trends yet? No, I think the, 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 the city government in Paris has made some decisions about how it's going to accommodate that. And I think the price point of real estate there, as we can all imagine, is, uh, is not necessarily amenable to that. But they've made some partnering decisions with the major business interests there. So I think it's a partnership that's allowing this to happen. Um, and that makes some sense. Uh, but we were struck by the fact that we're doing this and they're doing that, uh, if you look at it. Mm -hmm. Here, and then we'll come over. Has the uh, Georgia State Advisory Committee that you showed a slide of, uh, did they tackle the issue of uh, distribution center uh, decentralization here in the U.S.? Did they address that? Who might answer that? <laughs> Tom? Yeah. Um, Tom? We haven't gotten to that point yet. Um, there's still some dust settling. Most folks know um, at the national level about hours of service for truckers. and. Um, locations for warehouses. You did a great job talking about some of the considerations. Another one would be how far truck drivers are legally allowed to drive. Right. And some of those locations have been kind of set with that hours of service in mind. And now the hours of service requirements for drivers are changing. That's kind of that's causing some shift in the industry. So dust is not settled. Nice. Good. Kevin, I just wanted to ask you about uh, the uh, employment, uh -huh. the employment disaggregation. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to go contrary to what you said, but it, okay. it was surprising to me do <laughs> based on... My students do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just surprised me based on um, a lot of the uh, development trends that are, seem to be changing these days and, and different um, uh, uh, living patterns. You know, like say millennials and, and, uh, and younger people want to you know, right. live you know, more closer into the city right. where, you know, where the action is. It, it just seems that, um, that employment would probably tend to follow where people want to live, or, or am I mistaken? We're not finding that. And I, I think what we're really saying is that more people, more jobs, and where are those new jobs going to be located? And so we're looking at those nodes, not all of which, as you can imagine, can be in the city, right, for all kinds of reasons. So, um, so I think um, the answer is people are living uh, and making different decisions about living, but the employment issue, it seems to me, is not as straightforward. Uh, and, and, and of course our work, and actually I have a colleague, Tim, I want to make a comment, our work suggests that in fact the notes that we're looking at in terms of just the employment and jobs, we're going to have to really face the idea of how people are going to access those. Okay, I think with that uh, uh, I'll end it. And Dave, uh, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much.